used it by now. So the reactive graph, this chapter would give us an overview of how the reactive graph works. And I liked it very much because it's very, the representation is very visual. It, um, it, it's, um, it made me understand at least to the first degree what's going on in the calculations behind. But before we go into the chapter, I found very useful to revisit some of the things that I sh we, we already looked into, but I forgot. <laughs> so maybe in case you forget, I'm going to just go through them very briefly. So in the basic reactivity chapter, we learned about the distinction between two ways of um, of um, of having a program work. So either giving instructions one by one, do this, do this, do this, like a list of, of things, which is more of our regular R way of writing scripts. And there is the declarative, the, the, the shiny way where we, we set up all the necessary and then the program runs. And um, it's not, it's slightly more complicated if you're not used to in, uh, this logic, but it's very useful, very handy in everything that has to do with, um, with uh, interactive graphics usually. A second point is uh, laziness. So we set up things, but they are not run until we actually have to, well, until they actually call. Um, so uh, we save processing time, but we have to keep this in mind. Just because we wrote something doesn't mean it's going to be um, executed. Uh, there's the notation that we are going to see again in this chapter. There's the different shapes where this the, the name shape this we can think of the input intermediate and output so name string greeting uh, there are the three types of shapes we're going to see in the different graphs they represent a different um, um, parameter a um, um, result of what we of the different type of programming is the execution order so we could imagine writing things in the reverse order with or on all sorts of random orders and they would still work fine. It makes sense to write them in some sort of grouping order where similar things go together and usually we can somehow mimic the layout, which is useful. And then there are some more details where we have some um, um, two important functions. The reactive expressions, which we define with reactive and parentheses, and observers, which one example that was given in chapter three was the observe event. Uh, that was uh, mentioned in um, giving a handy way of, um, of debugging. Um, so, ah, by the way, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt or something is not clear. Um, with this brief uh, reminder, we can now jump into the, um, the actual chapter, which starts with an example. I copied here the code so we can um, have a look at it and compare it with the image. So in terms of um, of the user interface, we have some inputs and some plots and tables, uh, three ty different types of output. So we have input A, B, and C, and output X, Y, and Z. Um, I, can you see when I highlight something? Maybe it's helpful. OK. Yeah, sure. um, yeah. Okay, and then what we do with these three inputs are represented here in our graph notation. Um, this would be A, B, and C. Now, these three are used in the server notation in three separate reactive functions. So the first doubles input A, uh, it's RNG for range, uh, corresponds to this. Then the second one takes a, um, a sample of size B. Uh, just so we can make after a simple um, distribution. And the C uh, makes a multiplication and prints out uh, a text. So this six, these six lines correspond to this um, uh, figure. And the way we draw it is there's an arrow connecting um, the expression that depends on something else. So. We can think of it, um, it may be more intuitive to think of it backwards. So the the way the arrow is being pointed, whatever points from um, the, um, is the input and where the arrow show, uh, points towards is the output. So the, uh, the output depends on the input. Um, 
Does this make sense before we go into the... Okay. Um, so now we can look more into, in more detail into the example. Um, the book is very nicely, it has all these, um, all, all these figures that I didn't want to copy in our, uh, uh, in our repository. So I linked directly to it. And almost the same ones, but slightly uh, larger, and I think maybe perhaps more beautiful, are in the <laughs> React Log package, which we're going to talk about next. So I'm going to show the, these figures here. It's the same uh, example, inputs, intermediate reactive expressions, and outputs here. So exactly as we looked into before. So what we're going to go through is we're imagining the we are executing the app and we are following um, these um, uh, reactive values. There's a color coding um, used. Green means it has been um, evaluated. Gray, it doesn't, nothing yet. And yellow, we'll talk about yellow later on. So first thing is, this is what we drew by looking into the code. So if I go back, Sorry, here is by we were reading one by one expression, and we we could we should be able to do it by hand. It's um, maybe more complicated here, but in a big shiny app, it could be tedious. Um, here we have ready all these connections. So it, it, the moment we start a shiny app, um, everything is in a um, what's called an invalid state. So nothing depends on nothing in the beginning. And this is the where the dynamic part comes in. So in the beginning, we just have the reactive variables that are not yet linked to each other. So what Shiny does is it picks a output. Um, in the text, it says it's uh, we should consider it being random. So for all practical purposes, the output which starts is random. So this um, is being evaluated, and we we search to find this was the corresponds to output render plot, I think it was this. So we can go back through our notation and find and draw the first um, arrow. It depends on this function. Now we evaluate this function, we go back to our source code, we see, uh, so this was the output. The output points back to uh, one of our functions. Then we look what is the input of our function in order to draw the next arrow, the input is the a, um, the B, sorry. So we we create this arrow. So it's this one here. Uh, so input is B. And now we have a, a series of, um, of arrows going from input to output, and we know what depends on what. It also has another dependency on a different function, which I already forgot. Uh, it was ah, it was the range RNG. So it was input B, but also range. So now we need to draw a separate arrow. This range depends on A. So we have input A here. And we draw this green. Um, this now we have finished the full line of dependencies. So the end product, the, the output, can be green now because we know everything in which it depends. Now we can pick the second um, um, output and do the same uh, um, series of steps. So we chose output um, Y, which depends on a sample, SMP, which depends on, um, no, sorry, this should be, yeah, it should be the same. Depends on sample, uh, which, well, the full picture is drawn, so I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it depends on sample, which depends on, on, I maybe mix up with the Z and X. Let me see again. So, um, this one must be the Z because it depends on, Oh, sorry. I think I mixed up which is which I should have written down. Uh, let's look. Okay, let's work on it together. Maybe we can. I think, I think you're right. Extreme left ones are ABC. ABC. 
Okay, yeah. so the middle one should be I, Y. Yeah, this yeah. should be SMP. Yes. And then B. The bottom and one would be the A. bottom in the middle would be BC. BC. Okay. Ah, and this is this RNG. is RNG. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think before I messed up and said this was RNG. Okay. Uh, well. Well. Now that we we have everything drawn out, this was the the uh, the first. Uh, what happens right in the beginning? So this all happens really fast because it can be evaluated as soon as the as soon as the app is loaded. We started running. Now, what happens if we if we change an input? Um, so if we go in the app and uh, instead of our uh, and modify the value a, we just write a different number nine, let's say. So what happens here is since we have already drawn the arrows, we can see that. Once we change A, this is going to immediately affect, and let me check, I, I get it right this time. Once we change A, this immediately affects RNG, which would immediately affect SMP, and which would, which would uh, immediately affect downstream everything else. So here's how things happen. Um, they are still grayed out, the relationships, um, because these need to be recalculated. Um, so they're removed, and then we go back to doing the exact same process. So we start from the output. Um, not, so we start from the output, and we rebuild. So yeah, the, the final figure is not here. So we rebuild the this figure with the with all the arrows together. Um, so this is the the example and uh, we could jump in the book and see um, so the, the book has the same steps but i found it somewhat smaller and harder to follow and then it goes into uh after ex re execution in some exercises so let's uh, read through these together um the first one asks to draw the reactive graph and then think about it. Um, so I don't have a nice way of drawing it together, um, but uh, we can imagine it for now. I guess that would be good enough. So we have three inputs, x, y, and z, and two functions. There's a sum and the product that use all three. So it's, um, if we can think of the three inputs and the uh, Two functions that have all to all connections, all to all arrows. And then as a there's a, a further on, um, function, reactive function, that takes the division of these two. So it's like a three layered thing where we have three inputs, two intermediate functions, and then one function that uses everything else. And the question is um, why the reactives are not run. So my understanding of this is that we we said I think um, the reactors are, are lazy. So until we actually have an output that asks for division to be shown, we shouldn't we shouldn't see anything. Uh, the, the, nothing is shown. So we would end up being in be, being ready for it to run. And as soon as we add like a like a, a, a render text of division, we should have something uh, shown. Um, second one is slightly longer as a, um, as a text. So here we have three, we start with three reactive values and we, uh, the idea is to simulate a long process. So imagine the, this, uh, so we, we fake uh, the system sleep um, pauses for one second. So uh, we have three more functions. The uh, Y1 gives back just the value of X1. Y2 gives a value of X2 and Y3 uh, makes a, a sums up um, these values. And now we have an observer that actually do, does demand these values, the Y1, Y2, and Y3. And the question is, uh, how much time does it take to, to print things? Um, again, uh, uh, we can imagine the, uh, sorry, I don't have a nice way of drawing and I couldn't make a, we have the time, maybe I could have done it on a piece of paper. 
So we have the three inputs, X1, X2, and X3, with three intermediate um, uh, functions, steps, where Y1 has only a single arrow, Y2 a single arrow, and Y3 has a double dependency on X2, which is the input, and Y2, which is the uh, its uh, neighbor in terms of uh, not direct input, like intermediate neighbor, which goes back to X2. So it has a, a double connection. Now the time to recompute if X1 changes, this I think should be rather straightforward because we have the uh, X1 points towards Y1, which is directly printed. So this should be uh, a single second as far as I can think of. While if uh, X2 changes, um, this should uh, start the change in Y2. And once Y2 is changed, uh, Y3 would also change. Um, and then the output of Y2 and Y3 would be recalculated. So I initially thought that this would take longer, although I'm not very clear on it. And um, I, would, uh, I would like your input on this. Uh, Later on, because it seems to me that uh, Y2 and Y3 would need to be calculated. Um, this is, uh, and the same for X3. So X3 is used by Y3 and nothing else. So it has one dependency, so it should be um, as the first case. Um, so the, 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 uh, do you find the same thing or do you think the same thing? Because for me, it wasn't very clear. I wouldn't be able to confidently say it as this. Uh, yes, no, it was it was quite interesting that, um, so if, if X2 is um, updated, then, any arrow that comes out of X2 is kind of stripped away. And mm -hmm. Y2 and Y3 will need to be computed. Again. Um, why, if, if a reactive value has already been computed and it hasn't been invalidated, then none of these kind of sleep calls will ever get the, the, the corresponding sleep call won't won't so for example y1 if you update the value of x3 um, in that kind of print of y1 there will be no pause because y1 doesn't depend on x3 or anything um, mm -hmm. but yeah so it, it did seem that if you change x2 it should take two seconds to print because you're computing Y2 twice. again and you're computing Y3 again and each of those takes a second to run. Um, but I don't know, probably, probably <laughs> other people might disagree with me as well. <laughs> okay, then we can leave it there and rethink of it later on to just um this seemed to be the answer to me but i'm still not fully 100 percent convinced <laughs> sure, sure. um so maybe there are parts of it that are not very clear anyway so the last um uh, question asks for cycles because if you have a depending on b and b depending on a how these are resolved and uh, from what i can see they're not resolved so we're, we're gonna have an error uh, trying it out gives us an error. So it's, I guess, it, using the graphic notation, it should be easy to avoid, but um, it's something to keep in mind because the error message is not very helpful. It doesn't tell you have a cycle, it's just uh, out of memory or I can't remember exactly what the, it's. Um, um, yeah, I think it was something. Um, uh, overflow member error or something yeah. like that. Uh, okay, so now we we can go back to the um, next uh, 
Ah, here's the exercises. And we can go back to the um, dynamic part, which is um, also a bit confusing, but uh, quite interesting. So here we have an example. Um, it's a small, slightly modified example. It's from the book. So we have um, a shiny app in which um, we have two inputs and an output. It, uh, it, it's a very simple um, um, graph. Maybe we can see the graph from here, it's drawn. So what uh, naively we would imagine if we look uh, into this uh, code, we would see we have one selector for A and B, a numeric input for A, numeric input for B, and then the text output uh, that we calculate. So how the output is calculated uh, in this function, I completed out something that we're gonna visit later on. So if the input is A, so if the input choice is A, then, um, so if the choice is A, so if the selector is A, then input is gonna have the value of A. Otherwise it's going to have the value of B. And now if we, by naively reading this, we can assign uh, the um, arrows in the sense that output depends on what the user gives in A, what the user gives in B, or whatever the choice is made. Um, however, things are slightly more complicated because the arrows are not designed in the in the beginning, all arrows at the same time, but they follow the 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 process which we described above. So we have two possible configurations. We either have left or right. Maybe I should zoom in. Can, can you see it better now? So we have either the left or the right um, uh, graph, depending on what the choice, uh, what, what choice is selected. So if a user has selected the choice being A, then output depends only on A and on choice. If a user has selected choice B, then output depends on B or choice. And I'm moving back into oops, sorry, in, into the code to see here. The, uh, the interesting part is, is here, that uh, we modify um, the, we, the dependency is, um, the arrow is built here. So depending on what the input choice is. The commented section is a s small modification that changes the, um, the reactive graph. So if we add in front here two different dependencies, A becomes input A and B becomes input B, we force the graph to become this, the full graph. So we, oops, we we force the graph sorry, to become the full interconnected because we add in the beginning that out depends on both A and B. And this is something that depending on the context, we might want to do or we might not want to do. In the particular case, it's very abstract and maybe hard to think which case is better. Um, but it's, um, it's an interesting point that uh, I don't know, it, it shows the, um, how dynamic the graph is and how f fine, minute changes you can, you can do with it. Um, and the last um, part of the, of the chapter is the React log package. This is a shiny package. Uh, this is an R package that is um, very helpful in analyzing your, uh, your shiny app. Um, so we can look into an example I have here. Um, I'm loading here uh, an example from a very small example. It's the one we looked into the um, in this chapter. So just to see how it looks, we have a, an R session here. The the app is the one with the A, B, Cs and the range, uh, sample and calculation. So if I, ah, uh, I forgot to tell you. So before running the app, we need to um, enable the, the package. There is a function, there is a function react log enable. 
So once we do this, now we would be able to start the interface using, using command F3 in a Mac or control F3 in a, another computer. So I'm running the app and this is how it looks. There is uh, the number of points. I think this was how many um, samples we get. Uh, and this was just the, the, the we, it was changing the um, multiplication in the end. So we have the different outputs. So now we'd like to see what's going on behind. I just press Ctrl and F3 and the beautiful mm -hmm. um, representation of the app shows up. Um, so here it's slightly more complicated than what we've seen before. The reason is that these three, um, uh, we have a small interruption. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, so where are we? Okay. Um, so what we th the extra things we uh, that are shown are dependencies on of the of the plot. So I'm moving back into the plot. So if I uh, the, the this depends on on the size of the screen or on, on, on what we see. So there are things that were not mentioned in the simple representation, uh, but we can see them in the full representation here in the um, in the React log, React log um, package. So what we can do is rewind and go back to the very beginning, the first second that they launched the app. And we can step into and see what we discussed as uh, is happening. So one by one, the output is evaluated. It depends on a different um, uh, intermediate. Uh, these three, I'm going to skip over them because these are the, the width and the size of the screen for the plot. This is what we discussed, the function that does the sample. And this depends on on the random. Maybe I should align these. So we have A, B, and C. This is how it looked in our sketch. It's more like this. Uh, so ignoring these three, we can walk our way through. Um, well, aligning doesn't work. It realigns things automatically, I guess. Fine. Um, and then we can redo exactly what what happened, uh, what we we did in the beginning of the chapter. And what we can try now is go in and modify a value. Um, when I first loaded this, I did modify a first. I think I increased this value. So in the replay, we're gonna. We're going to see the modifications. This is being invalidated. So what depends on this is the range. What depends on this is the sample. What depends on this is the plot. And the relevant to the plot variables. So they are invalidated. Um, they remain in, um, you might notice here, the, the lines do not completely disappear. They remain as dotted lines. While in in our example, we completely remove them. Uh, this is uh, just for being able to make the, the layout consistent. Uh, but in, in fact, it's as if they don't exist because these relationships do not exist anymore and they have to be rebuilt. Again, once the output is evaluated, the new output is created. I'm skipping forward the graph and we're going, we're going back again, evaluating the sample, evaluating the range, and now we fill in all the values up until everything is green again. Um, so um, this is the React Lock package. It's quite um, powerful. It has many more details to look into. Um, so you can run it in a more large, shiny app in the app you're working on and try and use it. But just to sum up what we, I guess, what, what are the things I'm going to remember like in a month <laughs> from this chapter is that um, 
we have this representation of a shiny app, which is not, um, it, it, it's very uh, visual. So if I look at the web page, it's not what I immediately think, or if I look at the code, it's not what I immediately think, but trying to recreate this representation is very useful in adding new variables, modifying the code, if I have this in mind. The cycle of invalidation is important because we, it makes me think of the of the dynamic, how this changes and how sometimes small modifications in the source code can have a big effect in how the graph is created and how uh, things could go wrong. And the React Lab package, which seems to be an amazing uh, package that uh, I, I think it should make um, very easy developing and debugging any shiny app. So this is what I had for the chapter today. And uh, if you have any questions or comments or things to add, I would like to hear. Okay, yeah, no, that was great. Thanks, thanks, Diamantis. What, what I found interesting here was that you could, I mean, kind of perversely, you could have code that was unreachable in one of your um, reactive expressions. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, you know, like reading through the earlier chapters, you'd think that there was still, there would still be a dependency of whatever's computed by that expression on that, be it an input or a, another reactive expression or something. And so what 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 surprised me was the the there must be some way of when you're evaluating a reactive expression that it sends a message to some kind of global um presumably to the session variable or something like that i don't know um when you evaluate a particular reactive expression it must do something in the background that tells Shiny to connect itself to anything that it must evaluate in order. So it, it just seemed quite interesting and quite quite different from the way that I imagine R works normally. Um, yeah. I think this goes back to the goes back to the discussion we had last time about the. Yeah. Uh, the low level, what, what's going on behind Shiny that uh, yeah. we'd have to learn more about. Yeah, I got a question. Has anybody um, used the React Log package before on like a, a larger Shiny app, like something that's not just like a contrived simple example? Because I'm curious, like, I would imagine it can get pretty complex. It might be hard to to manage? Um, I try, I don't have a big, um, we could try something larger. A nameless was it. <laughs> Um, an install here. Sorry. Install mm -hmm. <laughs> that. Yeah, it has a, uh, it's about the same size. Hmm. No, I don't have another it. larger. I've tried using Sorry? it for something that I actually designed to do a bunch of stuff. Um, but to get it to really work, you end up having to click a bunch of different things and then look at it at the end. And so it it's useful, but 
it gets helplessly complex once once you get to a certain point. So I'd suggest like doing one thing um, and then looking at the log rather than like making a bunch of selections. Yeah, that makes sense. Make a bunch of them like they'll stack them on top of each other, and then it's it's incredibly hard to to follow. So like if you have ten inputs that go to eight different sub functions that go from there to there to there like it it just gets very very complex um and to follow it from one to another uh about the only good way to do it is to highlight um highlight your paths useful incredibly useful but but sometimes a, a bit like spaghetti yeah but i guess i mean i just kind of like with any like debugging like you want to try to isolate and focus on one thing only Otherwise it's too having it modular there. maybe some sort of modularity that would be useful for a big package yeah that was actually i haven't run it yet but i actually thought that it might be very useful with the bookmark the bookmarks that we were learning about way early on so that you could actually get down to that reactivity ah. so, so actually like have the reactive graph run off of the bookmarked page nice. so, that, yeah. so that you could get to where that um, that particular like bug or issue is to see like where it wasn't connecting rather than having to like, you know, select like five other things because that just makes the graph that much harder to read. Mm -hmm. I haven't done it. I, that was theoretically in my mind what I thought could be um, a very good use for it and what I thought would be helpful, at least in my mind. Yeah, seems like it would be. I'm convinced. <laughs> sounds like a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> but you can't specify that you're solely interested in a particular corner of the um, reactive graph of the various variables and whatnot. Um, when working with React Log, is that is that right? Presumably, you could separate if if your app is split into modules. Say you could mm. kind of define a kind of sandbox app that you use within React Log. If if you know that there's a bug within a particular part of your app, uh, I don't know whether that. Okay. Similar to like the. Um like a um, browser editor that would give you where you could focus on different parts of the HTML or other elements and yeah. look into yeah. its parts. Oh. Anyone else? Uh, Priyanka, I think you, uh, you, you often Chia when React Log is mentioned. I've noticed in the <laughs> comments over the past few weeks. Um, is this something that you use quite a bit then? No, not quite a bit, but when, when I started looking at the reactivity, that's when I figured that, you know, I think I found this on Twitter and then I think I, I tried it a little bit at that point. But yeah, I, I don't use it so extensively. I want to, but again, it depends. I have, I work on Shiny. You know, here and there, so I, that, that's when I try to use it. Yeah. Cool. Right, okay, I've got another something else if, if nobody else does. Um, for the exercises, like exercise two in particular, um, could you go back to that, Diamantis, please? So when, when updating X2, um, what I was thinking is that, okay, X2 changes, and that's going to lead Y2 to change, right? And so that's one mm -hmm. second. But then Y3 depends on Y2. So you're going to have, um, effectively, X2 and X3, it's going to be no effect, assuming zero, over, it's going to be a tiny little bit overhead, but it's trivial. Um, so, but when Y2 gets called, that's, I'm thinking that's gonna, or what I was originally thinking is both of those Y2 calls would be one additional one second each. 
but I'm kind of questioning that because if the value, if like Y2 doesn't change, what, once it's first computed, the second ah. time you call it, it's not going to actually recompute things, right? Mm -hmm. So I was originally thinking three seconds because, you know, X2 changes, Y2, um, sorry, Y3 updates, so that's one second. Sorry, Y2. So X2 changes, Y2 updates, so that's one second. And then Y2 gets called into X3, but now I'm thinking it would just be the one second because the second... Within Y3, those two Y2 calls are, it should just be able to retrieve the value, right? Or does anybody have thoughts on that? So Y2. I, think, I don't know if I'm just overthinking it and making it complicated, but. It's interesting. I looked in for the uh, solution in the solutions manual, but that um, I think they started it before the book was sort of more finalized, like it is now. So this this section is not in there at all. So you were saying that I, why when we change x. Mm -hmm. it would start we would have one second here sleeping mm -hmm. and then this is calculated so when we call it so all this called y2 plus y2 plus x2 takes zero more time yeah that's what i'm thinking because so i guess that first what within mm. the y3 reactive that first time you call Y2, then it, that's where the actual one second will come in, right? Because mm -hmm. it's not going to compute until it has to. But then the second one, I would think it's not going to sleep again because it, the inputs to Y2 haven't changed. It's already known. So I think that, yeah, I feel like that one now, now I feel like it would just take one second. So they would all take the same time, one second, or changing any single value, x1, x2, x3. Um, um, yeah, but well, yeah. yeah, I think so. Because I didn't uh, thought through the laziness, the, the fact that we, yeah, if it's calculated once, it should be known. And if we add here anything else, it wouldn't change the time of calculation, I guess. Yeah, I think this was, I, I think this is a good exercise. I think it was meant to be pretty tricky, mm -hmm. but it'd be interesting to see if um, anybody else had come to the same conclusion outside of this group. Now that you explained to it, it kind of makes sense. <laughs> I guess we can make the app and, and, and run it and <laughs> count and see how long it actually takes. Uh, we can run reactive things in the console, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, can we run them directly? Um, there's so, a special function you have to run first. You can see. Um, yeah, so, so if I set these. It's called reactive console. It's called reactive console true. And then put and that true in there. Okay, so let's try. So now I have three reactive values. Let's on the rest. Um, change this to three. 
Or I think you would just say x1 parentheses 3. Ah, right, yeah. Because that's kind of resetting it. So this would reset everything. It gives, oh, wait. Hmm. wait so how yeah. I would call it to see? Yeah, I don't know if that it, observe, the I don't know if that stays. Training? Yeah. So this should take a second to yeah. run. Like and if I mm, I try to <laughs> Yeah, it's it's fine. Maybe it's just doesn't want to, something's going on in the console, but maybe I'll build it on my own and then I'll, I'll uh, that. Yeah, let's let's think about it a bit more. It sounds as if it's something we should be able to to try in the console, but I can't see the way. Um, I think we don't have any outputs, so the outputs are not listening to any changing inputs, so I guess it's difficult to do it in the console. Yeah, that oh. makes sense. Like, because that, I think, and well, I think that observe would trigger it, but since it's only, maybe since it's only run on that, like, when you initially run it, then it's not going to. Well, move. Maybe yeah, if, you, if you change uh, x uh, x1 or something or x2, x3, uh, you have to change, I guess, uh, x, x2 or x3. And um, maybe you try it and then observe listens to this. I don't know. So you're saying x2 becomes. Uh... You know, I, I guess you have to uh, write x2 and parentheses. So, or, or x2 is already ah. a re reactive value, I have to, yeah, like that. But no, okay, observe doesn't react to it. <laughs> yeah. Maybe because maybe it just runs once in the console and doesn't continue listening. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not an output, it's just a reactive. Yeah, I would think we would have everything being printed every time we run it or something like that. Uh... I mean, in, in the app, you have outputs, uh, they are displayed all the time. So if you change something in the input and the output depends on it, uh, it recalculates everything needed. So, but here you have just reactives that are not used or displayed anywhere. So nothing happens. Yeah. So the test today is to make a really small Shiny up with this in the in the uh, uh, in the back in the server where we print mm. and have some sort of a timer, I guess, to see how long it takes. Okay. Something or you like could that. have a um, could you have a timer as your output? I'm trying to How work much? out whether there's a oh. way to... Uh, so we add here a new... We could add here like a... Yeah, I don't know. That's our homework for next time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We could have a collective homework.